Now, obviously, the towing are the first responders. Uh, so we've placed here a, a real heavy emphasis on their training. Um, and generally, by the time it, that vehicle gets to the collision shop, the, the hazard is, is, is much lower. Yeah. But not in all cases. It can go right from an accident right to a collision repair shop. Uh, how prepared do you think is the collision industry with this? Uh, not just with the training, but I'm talking about setting up the proper health and safety protocols and uh, emergency response plans in place. I think the industry has a, a long way to go. And I think um, a lot of it's based on that the frequency of this vehicle coming to the location is still very sporadic. Like there's some shops that have never seen an EV in their facility. And I'm not, a uh, hybrid is different, but I'm talking like a full blown EV. And you get companies like Tesla who, let's, let's face it, they are right now currently probably the main uh, source of EV that's on the road. And they've managed to curb everything so that it is directed to a Tesla certified facility. Now, again, you may be a Tesla certified facility or, or certified to do Tesla repairs, but having the plaque on the wall and actually exercising your skill set are two different things. Do they have it? And I, I think sometimes complacency falls into play again, where, um, you know, uh, for example, a battery has to come out of the vehicle. They might bring it into the shop and say, okay, well, today we're going to take the battery out of that vehicle. They get busy. They leave it overnight. Okay, we'll take it out tomorrow, and then next something could happen, right? It's the due diligence that they'll need to exercise. And I think um, much of this comes from uh, what I call customer processing as opposed to customer service. Everyone's in a rush. Everyone's pushing to do things super fast. You know, the quicker the cycle time, the quicker we get the car in and out, the better off, the more profitability, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to EVs, to technology, the ADAS, when you put all of these factors into a vehicle, you need to slow down. You got to stand back, take a breath, and you've really got to think about what am I dealing with? The last doctor that I want doing open heart surgery on me is the guy that's got a tea time booked at four and wants to get there as soon as he can. I want the person that's going to stand back and go, okay, let's take a look at this situation and let's put the knowledge we have to work and let's follow the protocol. And there's a reason that there's a protocol. It's not just because the engineers are bored. They got nothing to do. The protocol is there for a purpose. Let's follow it and let's allow the time to do it. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Joining me on today's podcast is Stefano Liesi. Stefano is a Red Seal technician, a refinisher, and founder of Canadian Collision Specialist a consulting company focusing on technical applications, processes, and relations. Stefano has 40 years of experience in the industry, as well as 15 years of ICAR instruction. Stefano holds a post-secondary degree, and through Skills Alberta, been training students who have received 11 medals while he was serving as a high school instructor for over six years. Stefano, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Ken. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Excellent. So I definitely want to get into the uh, uh, training and, and technical aspects uh, of EVs and uh, automation. But first, let's just uh, talk about EV adoption in general. I kind of I want to get to know your thoughts on these uh, government sales targets. Um, as you may know, in BC, uh, we've set some fairly aggressive targets here. Um, by 2025, I believe, it will be encompassing 25% of all new vehicle sales will be electric. By 2030, they're projecting 90%. And then finally, by 2035, that's going to be 100%. Uh, now, the federal government has followed suit as well. I think the difference with the federal government now is it's not voluntary, it's mandatory. And yeah. if the OEs don't actually reach that, uh, they're going to face some pretty heavy fines. How realistic do you actually think these targets are? I think the targets are realistic. I think people, um, they misinterpret some of the information. And 
because it is mainly your um, passenger vehicles and light duty vehicles. So that's a, it's a segment of the market. It's a big segment. But I also believe that um, over time, once things start rolling out and they start ramping up and we get past the, um, I guess, the, the uh, nuances of entry level, then it'll start to pick up speed. I mean, currently right now, if I look, I had some notes here this morning. Yeah, um, Alberta, we have 5,600 EVs in Alberta right now that are registered on the road. And in, 20, like you said, 2035, they want to be 100% uh, sales from the uh, OEs of those passenger vehicles. Right now, we don't even have 0.37% uh, of that mandate met. So if we were to increase it 8% every year for the next 12 years, it's, it's doable. It's possible. And you got to think, too, that over time, it's going to start to compound. So I, th I don't think it's unreasonable. I just think people are, um, a lot of people believe like, oh my goodness, it's got to happen right now. Everything's got to be EV like right now. And that's not what's happening. Any vehicle that is sold on the market up until 2035, that is a ICE or a gas internal combustion engine vehicle, it still has another on average 13 to 15 years of road life which means basically by 2050 is when you're going to actually see the, um, you know, the abundance of EVs replaced, uh, replacing your internal combustion engine right. vehicles. So it's, right. we've got a long time. Uh, absolutely. So I think in, in recent polling, I think they find that most people are receptive to purchasing an EV. Um, but I think as we move closer into those mandates, do you see a resistance sort of building if, if we're not fully prepared with the infrastructure? Um, I, I think that you are going to see some resistance, and it depends on your demographics. When I mean, you're in a big city like Toronto or Vancouver, Montreal, uh, it's far more receptive because it's a lot easier to, to charge your vehicle and get around. You live in Alberta, you find that there's a lot of distance, and developing that infrastructure is going to be key to having this be successful. It's, you know, you can't have gas vehicles on the road without a gas station, can't have EVs out there without the ability to charge it. But I do believe that, uh, again, it's one of those things where everyone thinks tomorrow everyone's going to have an EV and plug it in and everything's going to melt. Well, that's that's not the case. It's, it's going to be a gradual morphing of this. And as we develop infrastructure, you also have to realize that the batteries are going to become more... Um, more usable. They're going to have more, uh, you're going to have less uh, charge anxiety or range anxiety. You're going to get more range out of the batteries over time. Uh, the development and the research that goes into them is going to balance out possibly the time it takes to put the structure in. So everything's going to work together. It's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to, you know, it, it, there are going to be glitches. Let's face it. Uh, that's a reality. I mean, I still can't get cell service in a lot of places in Alberta and cell phones have been around a lot longer than an EV. So it's going right. to be, there's going to be growing pains, but eventually I think people will adapt to it. Right. Uh, what, what we find uh, with not only with with industry, but with consumers as well. And, and part of this uh, EV friendly mandate is really taking the voodoo out of these things, taking the mystery out of EVs. Mm. Um, I think people have a, a pretty good understanding of how their gas-powered vehicle works. Uh, they can sort of describe it to you. When it comes to an EV, not so much. Um, so we do our part to raise awareness. Uh, how can industry participate in this? What can industry do to help raise the awareness and, and the positivity surrounding this? I think industry, uh, just by advertising it, promoting it, talking about it, a podcast such as this or a webcast uh, is a great way to do it. I always tell people when I do my courses and that, that whenever you're researching information, please take the time to make sure you're getting viable, good information. There is, the internet has more garbage than good on it and you have to be careful with that. And I find even on platforms like LinkedIn or I know just going through Google and that, when you start researching this stuff, there is so much questionable information that leads you down the wrong path. Uh, if there's a way somehow to, you know, I don't know, I shouldn't say this on, you know, the internet, but censor some of the information, <laughs> then I think we, we would have a little bit more success with it.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually see that industry can play a far greater role in raising awareness by becoming ambassadors for mm -hmm. EVs. Uh, it would be my hope that government would actually utilize that. I don't think they are leveraging the industry in, uh, enough, uh, especially in, in the aftermarket. A lot of emphasis on just selling new vehicles, little emphasis on everything else. Uh, but we're, we're your front line. We're the ones that are out there talking with the consumers and repairing their vehicles. Uh, so it can go a long way for us to, to support that, uh, oh, that yeah. growth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as, as you, as you mentioned, uh, it is going to be a trickle, uh, it's not going to be all of a sudden tomorrow, everyone's driving EVs. No. Uh, in fact, probably mass adoption is not slated for until at least probably right around uh, 2050. Uh, we do estimate by around 2040, about 60% of all vehicles on the road, uh, will be EVs. Uh, I guess my question is, is the Canadian collision repair industry ready for EVs? Um, <laughs> right at this very moment, probably not. But again, it's one of those things where we have an industry right now where the attrition rate is uh, huge. Uh, the average technician in the collision industry, uh, I've heard different studies, different reports, but we are looking between you know, 45 and 55 years old. So you've got to think in another 10 years, there's going to be a, a mass exodus of people from the industry. And it's getting the younger generations, A, interested in trades, whether it's automotive repair, collision repair, or any other aspect of it. And B, when you're getting them interested, it's educating them on what's happening in the future. In many cases, you'll, you talk to apprentices and youngsters that are out there now, and a lot of the information they're getting is still dated. I recently had a conversation with a technician who just did their fourth year, and they were telling me that, oh, yeah, we did oxyacetylene welding in class. That's been obsolete for 15 years at least. Mm -hmm. Why are we still doing that? So the education industry really needs to pick up speed when it comes to educating these youngsters that are going to be coming out there because they're the ones that are going to be repairing these vehicles. It's not going to be me. I'm, I'm, I'm in my mid fifties, right? I'm not yeah. the guy and the industry is filled with people of my, uh, my generation. And most of them are the same. They're like, you know what? I'm not going to be fixing this. I don't, I'm not putting the effort into it. They're going to be moving on. So, getting the youngsters to do it and learn it and understand that hey it's not a you know we had to get away from the horse and carriage into the motor vehicle now they have to get away from the internal combustion engine to the electric um i see it being very possible as long as you eliminate a lot of the bureaucracy that ties things up if you can yeah, if you can get rid absolutely. of that uh, bureaucracy destroys innovation and if you can push that aside and start looking forward with it, then I can, I can see everything kind of morphing together. You know, your infrastructure develops, your technicians and education develop, your OEs and the research develops. And the next thing you know, 2050, the, you know, uh, as you said, over 60% of the vehicles on the road will be EVs and people won't really think any different of it. Right. Uh, you actually raised an extremely interesting point, and, and that is uh, we are right now in a transition phase. Mm -hmm. um, and this is touches not only on the collision, but also in the, uh, the repair industry, the mechanical repair as well. So we sort of have two streams going. Uh, we have the traditional ICE vehicles that are still being out there and manufacturing will be out there for a long time. Uh, then we have electric vehicles and following that will, will be the ADAS and, and automation. We'll get to that in a minute. So we're recruiting young people, uh, who they still need to work on the older technology, but they're going to have to be able to transition into the newer technology because mm -hmm. it's going to evolve and, and change rapidly. I think the, the skilled trades model, or at least here in BC, uh, as uh, we're one of the few provinces left that actually uh, don't have mandated skilled trades for the automotive industry, they're, they're turning to that now and within the next couple of years that'll be implemented but their model is now is you get your certification and then that's good for life um, but that's not really going to work because in 20 years what you've learned now mm -hmm. 
is either going to be obsolete or or uh, really as rapidly evolved. Um, would you agree that a better model is that we need a skilled trade certification with professional development, similar mm -hmm. to other professions? Like every year, you need to go back for additional training. Do you see that as the better path moving forward? I do, absolutely. Um, I see it all the time. I do training courses continuously, like for welding, aluminum welding, riveting, sectioning practices, OE procedures. And the one thing is, um, to your point, you get your certificate and you're good to go. And people don't want to take the time to invest in their education. They don't want to upgrade. They don't want to take the welding classes. They don't want to advance because they already know it. You know, they know everything. But then when they get to your class and you start going through things and you start showing them what they don't know, sometimes it's a little bit of a shock. They don't realize it. If you have ongoing and continuous education, whether it's through your OEs, whether it's through um, educational institutions like uh, BCIT or Nate State Centennial College, whatever it is across the country, um, you have to educate people because the, the vehicle's developing. So we worked on the same thing for decades. You know, like if you look back to the 1950s all the way up to the uh, early to mid 80s, the vehicle didn't change that much. I mean, you know, it did, but not really. You know, we went to the unibody and we started in, uh, dabbling with electronic fuel injection. But from the 80s to now, you look at the, what has happened to the automobile, it has, in, the technology has increased tenfold. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a very uh, uh, steep hill that it's gone up. And if you're not staying on top of that education, you're going to fall behind. To your point about the transition, I think it's the optimum time to actually embrace it. So you have uh, a transition into this EV culture. This, you know, we're, this is where we're going. The government has mandated it. So it's an obvious, this is it. And we are now looking for younger generations to come into the trades and work on these. Now's the time to change that whole platform, that education. Again, get rid of the bureaucracy, start developing right. it, and have everyone morph together. And now it becomes a, I don't want to say a seamless transition, but a much smoother transition. And you don't have these blockages in the way. And I, I believe that that is probably the answer. And I know there's some people out there that want to shorten the apprenticeship programs and they want to make them quicker so we can like throw bodies at the problem. That's not going to work. If you yeah. start throwing bodies at something, you're just creating bottlenecks. So, uh, so how can colleges uh, partner up with associations or private training facilities or, or people like yourself to help facilitate this? Because um, it, 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 training is expensive. It, it, it places real burdens, on, especially on the smaller shops. Mm -hmm. uh, how We need to more effectively deliver this training, whether it's online or through, through local communities. Uh, how can we go about achieving this? And, and what support do you think we need from government? Well, I guess in a sense, um, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a politically centric person, so I... I I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know how all the inner goings on of politics is. But in my opinion, and you're all entitled to my opinion, if you have a body of government that's going to mandate something, then I believe that they should mandate the supports that go with it. So we want DOEs to create these EV vehicles by a certain time. Now, whether it's your you know federal, provincial government, uh, I'm not going to use names or anything, but I'm going to say that generally speaking, if they're in politics, they don't really know anything about engineering, designing and building an automobile, right? But yet they're telling these people, you have to do this in a certain time. And if that's the case, then I think that the government's going to have to stand back and say, okay, we're going to have to provide funding and we're going to have to provide the uh, groundwork and the infrastructure to support this idea that we put out there. I'm not saying the idea is bad. I'm not saying that it's not, um, you know, doable, but it is much more doable with the proper supports in place. And that would 
that would have to come financially. I mean, let's face it, as you said, training, education is expensive. Um, you can't expect a young journeyman technician who's making, you know, maybe 40K a year to start dumping $40,000 a year into their education. So if you're going to bring in, if you want everyone to do what you want them to do, you're going to have to provide them the tools to do it. You can't just say you're on your own. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. I think this could be one of the unattended consequences of mandating uh, uh, these type of targets. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can all get in support of it. Uh, but again, too much of the emphasis on new car sales. The cars have a long life. They can live mm -hmm. up to 20 years or longer. Uh, we have to do more than just think about the new sales and the end of final end of life, which is the recycling. There is a whole gray area in between, I think, that we, we need to address. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it also gets into um, uh, not only on the training aspect, uh, but road safety in general. EVs uh, are certainly posing some challenges, uh, and so will the ADAS systems. Uh, now, a ADAS is not exclusive to EVs no. as well, but EVs are going to accelerate that adoption just because of the, the processing power involved with these vehicles. Uh, so my, my next question to you is uh, to do with ADAS, and I'll just explain to everybody uh, what ADAS is, um, uh, Advanced Driver Assisted Systems. Um, so when we talk about uh, automation of vehicles, uh, it ranges from zero to what's called level five. And zero is no automation at all. So the driver is fully in control. And level five is complete autonomy, meaning you've got into a vehicle, no steering wheel, no gas pedals, no nothing. That vehicle fully drives itself. And, and, and ADAS encompasses a lot of that in between. So how do you see the impact, at least in the foreseeable future, say 10 years out, of how these ADAS systems are really going to affect uh, the industry and how we repair these vehicles. ADAS is, um, it's an interesting, um, I guess it's an interesting concept in the automobile. So when you put ADAS into something, you're creating a, um, you're, you're creating an environment for the consumer to become maybe uh, more complacent with their driving. So I, I've read some studies where people that rent a car, so I think it was Enterprise or uh, National Car Rental that did a study and they found it was a certain percentage of people that would look over their shoulder three times because they didn't have ADAS in their vehicle. And then when they realized that the little light on the mirror was telling them what they wanted to know, after three to four times, they kind of, I don't need to look over my shoulder anymore. I got this new rental car that I'm using. So they, and I'm not saying that everybody does that, and that's the only, that's the one thing we can't make a blanket statement for everyone. But in general, people will become complacent. Um, I do the drive from uh, Edmonton to Calgary quite frequently, and I've had vehicles with adaptive cruise control. And I'll be honest with you, uh, it's a boring drive from Calgary to Alberta. is It's basically a straight line with one turn in the middle of it, and. Um, you become complacent and I use the adaptive cruise control. So what's going to happen is people think, oh, well, once you have ADAS, or we won't need collision shops anymore. But the fact is we still have to have the ability to override ADAS, uh, regardless of how much is in the car. We still, um, when it comes to litigation in the courts, it's who's going to be accountable for when something goes wrong. And no one has stood up and said, yeah, I'll take the cookie on that one. So we're always going to have that. Um, so there still will be accidents. Will they be different? Yes. Will the repairability of the vehicle be different? Absolutely. Will there be different um, uh, processes or things that you need to do to repair the vehicle? Absolutely. So it's going to change. But it's no different than, you know, high strength steels, carbon fibers, aluminum, uh, the structures of the vehicle, engineering. It's all changed as we've gone along. And I think, again, while you're educating the younger generation on EVs and the battery packs and all of that electronic um, monitoring that takes place, they're going to learn about their ADAS features. The one thing I will say is with ADAS, good enough is not an acceptable repair plan. So 
for example, a sensor on the front of a vehicle, if it is out of place by two millimeters, that's a five degree variance uh, for that sensor. So that five degree variance places the sensor pointing at the wrong object as it's, if you, let's use um, collision avoidance or uh, adaptive cruise control. If I have a five degree variance in my angle of that sensor, what happens is my sensor is no longer picking up the transport truck in front of me. It's looking above it and it cuts my distance down about, I'm going to say roughly about 50% of my braking distance is sucked up by that two millimeter error. That's a huge impact. Um, so accuracy, the level of repair and the quality of the repairs have to go up. They, we, again, good enough is not, good enough right um with uh, ADAS. absolutely yeah and i think you've touched on our some really good important points there uh, dealing with road safety as we move through the adas levels into full uh full autonomy uh we those vehicles those so-called smart vehicles are also going to be sharing the the road with apparently some dumb drivers as well, well it's no um, shortage of stupid out there it, it, absolutely. And people need to be educated. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know much about the, the driver learning programs or anything like that. I think they do go through the basics, but there's really very little education on how we interact with these systems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do we need to look over our shoulder um, or can we completely rely on that electronic system to do that, that for us? Um, these are all, I think, really, uh, really important questions. You've also touched on the need to very accurately uh, repair and calibrate these vehicles. I think it's a very important point. Mm -hmm. Now, I think insurance companies do a pretty good job of regulating that and, and, and uh, uh, demanding the, the training, uh, but there's a whole industry outside of that as well, of the non-insurance. Uh, do you feel that government has a greater role to ensure that only qualified and trained professionals can actually work on these vehicles? And do you think we're doing enough in that direction? Um to that point, it kind of goes back to that. If you're going to mandate something, you need to put the things in place to support it. So one, it, again, this is an opinion, but um, mm -hmm. the one thing in our industry, in the collision repair industry, is we don't have a governing body that oversees us. We are basically self-regulated. And what I mean by that is if you're a plumber, electrician, carpenter, you have a code book that you have to follow. And that code book is issued by, you know, the, either the, uh, the governing board, the government that says, you know, when you put wiring into a house, you have to meet these certain criteria. We don't have that in our industry. And it may be time to do that. And I know there's a lot of people might be listening to this absolutely going off their stick thinking, oh, no, you don't want to get the government involved in collision repair. But... If you don't have someone walking through your shop or you don't have someone coming in and checking up on these issues, then who's going to be accountable? And, and when does it happen? Is it when a family of four perishes because of this? So it's something that um, I think could be addressed. And maybe now with this transition is the time to slowly implement some kind of governance in the industry, which will also help with many other factors. You know the uh, the structure of pay, the the uh, accountability for the different processes. You know, like if you want a a licensed electrician to come in and do the repairs in your house, we know that it's not economical, right? Um, and in our in our industry, we don't have anything like that that governs us and oversees us. So it's really easy to put a plaque on your wall that says, "Oh yeah, I'm OE certified," or you know, "I have my my EV friendly certificate." That's great. But if no one's watching to make sure you're applying that knowledge, then really it's just a, you know, it's a picture on the wall. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And it's more to do with the governance than it is through, through regulation. I know regulation <laughs> can be a, a bad word, uh, but it can be structured in a way that uh, the overall governance is industry working with regulators mm -hmm. uh, to ensure the best possible outcomes. Uh, so, uh, speaking of uh, uh, repairing EVs or, or ADAS systems, do you have a story you could share, whether positive or negative, uh, related to one of these vehicles being uh, being repaired, and what can we learn from that? I can't um, 
like I, it didn't happen to me personally. However, I have an acquaintance in the industry that uh, is fully aware of this situation that's happened. Uh, a camera was put onto the front of a vehicle and the camera wasn't working correctly. However, when the person would go back to the dealership or the repair facility, they would take the car for test drive and they'd say, I don't, we can't find anything wrong with it. Everything's fine. Customer would take their car and they would get to a certain location on the highway that the vehicle would stop. It would just automatically stop and they could not figure out what was going on. And what it was, was because of the camera, the way it was situated in the vehicle and the way it was calibrated, the, it was reading the lines on the highway. And apparently this one area of their, their neighborhood was, um, there was a left exit. So you know how normally you're on a highway, it's, you know, the right lane is where you'd exit off of, to get off of somewhere. This particular situation, I think it was the left side of the highway had an exit that they could use to get off somewhere. And the camera would see the solid line and it would stop the car and not allow it to exit. And that was all because of a malfunction calibration that was done. But yet it's, you can't see it until you experience it. So there's still a lot of learning. There's still a lot of um, um, education has to go on with this and emphasis on the importance of calibrating. And uh, there was another incident where a camera was put on upside down or a radar a sensor was upside down and the vehicle would read like it would stop because there was a bridge up ahead. And it wouldn't see like it would see the bridge and think it's a vehicle. And like there's there's quite a few of them out there. Um, percentage wise, it's probably a small percentage, but still, nonetheless, it can happen. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're right. Education and and, and awareness is uh, extremely important, not only with consumers, just with industry uh, as well. I think there are those shops that have become really progressive. They've they've gone out. They mm -hmm. they've sought the training. Uh, I think some people uh, don't know the full ramification or implications of this technology and just think, well, they can just do it. Or I've watched a YouTube video. I know <laughs> how to do it. Uh, there's a real emphasis, obviously, on the the health and safety. Uh, of these vehicles now i do want to state evs are extremely safe mm -hmm. um but we do hear about the incidences of them either spontaneously catching fire or in the aftermath uh, of an accident uh, they're a different beast when they do erupt into flames because it's not a matter of just putting it out uh, you can put it out and 24 hours later uh they reactionate and they they erupt again we have some pretty crazy cases as well that's been popping up in bc uh, so there is a, a real emphasis on the pr safety protocols that mm -hmm. need to be in, in, in place. I, I, and on the collision repair, I, I don't really even know how equipped they are with that. Um, now, obviously, the towing are the first responders. Uh, so we've placed here a, a real heavy emphasis on their training. Um, and generally, by the time it, that vehicle gets to the collision shop, the, the hazard is, is, is much lower. Yeah. But not in all cases. It can go right from an accident right to a collision repair shop. Uh, how prepared do you think is the collision industry with this? Uh, not just with the training, but I'm talking about setting up the proper health and safety protocols and uh, emergency response plans in place. I think the industry has a, a long way to go. And I think um, a lot of it's based on that the frequency of this vehicle coming to the location is still very sporadic. Like there's some shops that have never seen an EV in their facility. I'm not, a uh, hybrid is different, but I'm talking like a full-blown EV. And you get companies like Tesla who, let's, let's face it, they are right now currently probably the main uh, source of EV that's on the road. And they've managed to curb everything so that it is directed to a Tesla certified facility. Now, again... You may be a Tesla certified facility or, or certified to do Tesla repairs, but having the plaque on the wall and actually exercising your skill set are two different things. Do they have it? And I, I think sometimes complacency falls into play again, where, um, you know, uh, for example, a battery has to come out of the vehicle. They might bring it into the shop and say, okay, well, today we're going to take the battery out of that vehicle. 
they get busy, they leave it overnight. Okay, we'll take it out tomorrow and then next something could happen, right? It's the due diligence that they'll need to exercise. And I think um, much of this comes from uh, what I call customer processing as opposed to customer service. Everyone's in a rush. Everyone's pushing to do things super fast. You know, the quicker the cycle time, the quicker we get the car in and out, the better off, the more profitability, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to EVs, to technology, the ADAS, when you put all of these factors into a vehicle, you need to slow down. You got to stand back, take a breath, and you've really got to think about what am I dealing with? The last doctor that I want doing open heart surgery on me is the guy that's got a tea time booked at four and wants to get there as soon as he can. I want the person that's going to stand back and go, okay, let's take a look at this situation. And let's put the knowledge we have to work and let's follow the protocol. And there's a reason that there's a protocol. It's not just because the engineers are bored. They got nothing to do. The protocol is there for a purpose. Let's follow it and let's allow the time to do it. And I think that plays into many things, whether it's training, education, repairability, the, the service of the customer. Just slow down, get a grip and process it. As for the shops, you know, there's a lot of things. I was reading some studies, uh, some articles the other day. Um, having storage facilities for batteries like you can't just take a battery out of an ev that you're going to be working on for two or three weeks and leave it next to the car it needs to be in a vented location it needs to be away from other potential hazards so uh, they were describing like an outbuilding you take an EV, a battery out of an ev you take it outside you put it in this outbuilding on a rack that is ventilated and climate controlled because the battery needs to know it needs to be 70 to 75 degrees fahrenheit like there's a lot of protocol that's involved and i don't know of anyone that's up to that speed yet and it's a it's a game changer in all honesty it, I, I i absolutely agree with uh, uh with that i mean we we've worked quite closely uh, with our provincial work safe pc uh, and mm -hmm. developing the protocols for the towing industry uh, and as well for the recycling. Um, but our next project is to begin that uh, with the collision industry uh, because it, it can't be overlooked. And uh, mm -hmm. I think my fear is that that shops will just start taking on these vehicles. They want the work and they think, hey, even my tech has gone out and training, but I don't yeah. actually have my own business prepared as much for that uh, mm -hmm. with, with these with these protocols. Um, I, I kind of want to get back a little bit into the ADAS okay. uh, and be a little speculative here um, because we are moving uh, more and more into, uh, into full autom uh, automation uh, and also with the advent of artificial intelligence um, that is going to have some real profound effects on, on industry. Dealing just with the vehicle itself, uh, is AI going to make the cars more intelligent and do you think one day uh, the cars will actually be able to diagnose themselves? Um, that's a pretty loaded question in some ways, I guess. Um, will it be able to diagnose itself? I think a vehicle can diagnose itself if it is a electronic issue, you know, something that is related to the series of circuits that are in there, the monitoring system. So you have uh, body control modules, you have safety restraint modules and these things when there's a glitch or an error it's kind of like a malfunction indicator lamp right comes up on your dash and it tells you something's wrong that i can, I can see these types of things happening a car is going to limp mode um, they have different reactions some cars won't shift out of park they won't start based on certain things and i i believe yes ai probably is going to have an impact on a lot of these things are we going to be at the point where we've created Christine, where the car is going to fix itself and come back to life? I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, and we must remember, AI is only as intelligent as the data that it has been given to process. That it, it, right. it, it does not think for itself. It's not sentient. And 
if that ever happens, well, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. But if it does, kudos to the people that create it because that takes a lot of intelligence. Is it a good idea? I don't know. Um, I'm skeptical on that, right? I, I've seen some artificial intelligence that's not all that intelligent. So um, the one thing that I, I, I look at when people talk about this, like the self-driving autonomous vehicle, you know, everyone's excited by that. And they're like, oh, we're going to have these self-driving vehicles. And, you know, you're going to be able to read a book and let the car drive. Again, it's the accountability for what if something goes wrong? Uh, as you saw today, right? <laughs> Your batteries are 100% and all of a sudden, they start, we had this, you know, you have to stop and restart something. Mm-hmm. It's not infallible. Nothing, nothing is infallible. Let's face it, nothing is. Um, I always equate this scenario to a, an airplane. Auto, autopilot has been a feature on a Boeing 747 or a Concorde or whatever it is for decades. But yet, there's always two pilots in the airplane. They don't have stop signs. They don't have inter, you know, <laughs> intersections. They're not driving through traffic. They don't deal with pedestrians. They're up in the sky, 35,000 feet. Uh, and yet there's two pilots in there. So now we're going to take, you know, and that's a multi-million dollar object. I, I can't remember what the price of a plane is, like $37 million or something crazy for an airplane. But yet we're going to take a, sake of argument, a $100,000 car, and we're going to stick it in the streets of New York or Toronto or Vancouver, and we're going to let it drive itself? I'm, I'm, going, I'm skeptical. Sorry, uh, that's just my pessimism, I guess. But realistically, that's, that's how I equate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it would it, take a lot for me, I think, to get into a, a car that's driving itself, yeah. uh, let, alone, uh, let alone play. Um, Maybe a little different for the for the younger generation. Uh, we we spoke a little earlier uh, with the the labor attraction, uh, sort of the 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 traditional stream of repair, and then this new stream of repair mm-hmm. as well. But touching on the automation and the AI, um, how do you think in the collision repair industry AI will either augment the job uh, or really even eliminate it in in, in some ways? I don't. I personally don't believe that it'll ever be eliminated. And again, maybe that's just my generation. I'm showing my age, but uh, how will it augment it? Uh, we see it now in welders, you know, so we have uh, what we call smart welders in the shop now where they're designed to help the technician weld better. We have uh, welding uh, equipment that duplicates the factory welds on a vehicle using squeeze type resistance spot welding. And, it's very intelligent. It's very smart. It has been a game changer in our industry. Um, uh, glue glue pull repair um, is another game changer where we can actually glue things to the car and use them to pull dents out of the car without grinding and, and destroying the corrosion protection on the vehicle. It's fascinating uh, game changer. Uh, AI, when it comes to actually fixing the vehicle, uh, you're still going to have to have that human interaction. You know, no two cars are the same. No two accidents are the same. Uh, and therefore, AI is going to be good to assist the technician in repairing the vehicle. But I don't think it's going to replace the technician. Um, people use a, a refinishing, so spraying, like a, a robot that can spray paint the side of a vehicle. That is That's great, but... Who's going to change the paint in the robot? Who's going to set the robot up and program it to paint just the hood of the fender and on the next vehicle to paint just the door and the trunk lid or, you know, a Mercedes Sprinter van versus a Mini Cooper? If we get to the stage where a robot can do all that by itself, um, again, not in my time, but uh, for the near future, I, I don't see that. I see the collision industry being very stable because once again there's no shortage of stupid people will do things to have collisions they will override adas they will they will do these things um but i do see the industry changing and i think it's changing much for the better we're getting better equipment uh better safety equipment 
better repairing equipment. The technicians are learning how to use this equipment. They're applying it better, which in the end makes the vehicle, um, the, the repair process, a much better process. Like I said before, it's good enough isn't going to cut it anymore. And I think we have the ability to to step up the game and make it a better process. And uh, so I yeah. don't think it's going to be eliminated. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I, I mean, we've been hearing so much hype about the AI and you've heard of chat GPT and GPT-4 now. Uh, it's a pretty powerful and amazing tool. But the other day I, I had to fix my toilet doing a little bit of amateur plumbing. Mm -hmm. And I thought it's going to be a long time before they build a robot that can do this. Mm -hmm. So... I absolutely agree with you on that. So some uh, final thoughts uh, from you. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would give a collision repair shop that could position themselves for the next five or, or, or 10 years? What, what, what would you say? What's, what's, what's one essential thing that they need to start thinking about or doing? For a uh, collision shop in our climate right now, I, I honestly would say slow down, take the time and start educating not only your techs, but your client base. Uh, stop processing people and start uh, educating people on how long it's going to take to repair this vehicle and how uh, what's involved in it and learn about it. Um, I don't have all the answers. I wish I did. If I did, I'd be on a sailboat in the Caribbean right now, but I don't. So the... The shops do have to pay attention to what's going on. Make sure they're getting reliable information from good sources and being aware of the changes that are coming. And don't don't leave it to, well, I've been doing it like this for 10 years. What's the difference? I'm okay. Or uh, I'm going to get out of it in a couple of years. So what's the point? I, you got to get rid of that thought process. Uh, embrace it, whether you like it or not. Um, Ken, I'm going to be honest with you. I drive a car that has a V8 motor in it, right? <laughs> I have a big sedan. That's that's me, you know. I, I tell people if the day comes when I buy an EV, it'll probably be my mobility scooter because I'm just not in that bracket right now. Um, but that doesn't mean I disagree with it. That doesn't mean I don't like it. It just means that there's a change that's coming and I'm going to slowly prepare myself for it. And when that day comes... Um, I'll look at it and say, okay, here we are. Let's let's jump on board and let's go. The shops have to try and do the same thing. But it, I can't stress it enough. It's time and patience. And those are the only two. Th well, time is the only thing you can never get back or duplicate. So uh, embrace now what you got and utilize that time to your full advantage and be patient. Right on. I think that's I think that's great advice. Uh, so, for any shop owner uh, or anyone else um, that wants to, to get a hold of you, uh, how do they do that? And do you have any upcoming events you're attending or webinars that they could uh, see you on? Uh, my website, CanadianCollisionSpecialist.com. Um, I'm not going to spell my email out there. It's my asliesi at CanadianCollisionSpecialist.com. Uh, they can get a hold of me there. I'm working on some estimate training courses right now, trying to um, do some advanced estimate training for uh, facilities uh, regarding you know the OE processes, blue, blueprinting, repair planning, etc. Um, I do a lot of ICAR courses, so I subcontract for ICAR and I do courses for them. I will be out in Ontario. Um, I'm doing some Spinezi training with their products. I'm also working on... Um, uh, car bench and GYS. So I'm trying to learn as much as I can about all of the equipment that's out there so that the shops can get good information on how to use that equipment properly. I just became certified uh, for uh, Kiko glue repair pulling. So I promote that and, uh, and I do a lot of webinars for iCar as well. Excellent. Well, and we hope to see you uh, at an upcoming CCIF. I hope so, so too. meet in person. Yeah. So Great. Uh, Stefano, you, thank you very much. Are right. you going to be in Calgary or, or, uh, I'm, th I'm thinking of it. I've got a few, I've got a few events, uh, okay. happening. Uh, we have a, depending on the, the dates, we have a, uh, the fully charged show, uh, is coming to Vancouver. 
uh, okay. and it's uh, it's an international show that's uh, really taking over. I think our local car shows as, as well as everything yeah. transitions to EVs. So as long as it's not a conflict, I should be in Calgary. We'll uh, we'll hope to see you there, Stefano. Thank you very much for uh, for joining the podcast. It's been a great talking to you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. It's been great. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please like and subscribe or leave your comments below. If you don't have time to catch a full episode on our YouTube channels, check out EV Friendly on the Go, our audio podcast available on Spotify or wherever you download your podcasts. Thank you.